Coming up on We Talk News this week, Virginia Governor Glenn Youngkin becomes cannabis public enemy number one after vetoing a bipartisan legal sales bill handed to him by his legislature. And Utah Senator Mitt Romney writes a letter to the DEA urging them not to reschedule cannabis. So two politicians using their power and position to show they won't be swayed by public opinion. Meanwhile, that public opinion is on the latest Pew Research poll now showing close to 88% of adults over 21 in the U.S. want cannabis legalized. And Amazon gets ripped for offering CBD and THC products on its platform, violating their own rules, and then those products are exposed to have barely a trace of either of those cannabinoids in them. And it's opening day for legal weed in Germany. Adults over the age of 18 can enjoy the plant legally now. And former governor of Minnesota and pro wrestler Jesse, the body Ventura, enters the legal edibles market in his state as they prepare their new regulations in the land of 10,000 lakes. All that and coast to coast cannabis news coverage on We Talk News next. We are pro-cannabis media. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Weed Talk News, pro-cannabis media's weekly news show for the cannabis industry. I'm Jimmy Young in Massachusetts. And I'm Karen Black in Arizona. Elena Pinto is off this week. We start our coast-to-coast -coast cannabis coverage with some disappointing news. Virginia Governor Greg Youngkin vetoed a cannabis legalization initiative his legislature handed him this week. Joe Parsons is our man in Virginia with reaction from that state. I'm Joe Parsons from the Virginia Cannabis Connection with the Virginia Cannabis Report on Weed Talk News. You know, back in 2021, then-Governor Ralph Northam signed a bill to legalize responsible use of cannabis by Virginians, and the state became the first one in the South to do so. Now, all that law really did, though, was allow residents to grow up to four plants and possess under an ounce without being arrested. Opening up a vibrant adult use sales market has been contentious in the state legislature since then. And 2024 was the target year for the market to open, until this week. This past week, Governor Glenn Youngkin vetoed the bill that the legislature worked hard to create, including guidelines and regulations for sales and many social reforms, including resentencing relief for those who have been convicted for nonviolent cannabis crimes. Earlier in the week, Youngkin prepared the public for disappointment about whether he would sign the bill, veto the bill, or allow it to pass without his signature. He said to a reporter, anyone who thinks I'm going to sign that legislation must be smoking something. Not a good sign the governor would deliver a legal adult use market to Virginia. He did not. And in his veto message, he cited his interpretation of the facts that legalization leads to the destruction of people's health and safety, increased violent crime, and deterioration in mental health. He then knocked the expected tax revenue and tied road safety and cost of enforcement that offset any benefits for further acceptance of legalization. Finally, in his four-page veto, he left Virginians with no help for the future consideration as he wrote, quote, attempting to rectify the error of decriminalizing marijuana by establishing a safe and regulated marketplace is an unachievable goal, end quote. The fallout from this action has enraged both the senators that worked together crafting these bills. Many civil rights groups who supported it, including myself, have all vote, vowed to keep pushing for reform and to never give up, no matter how long it takes. Did you know that Virginia is the only state in America where as a governor can't run for office consecutively? So time will heal all wounds. But I doubt the voters who helped elect him in 2022 will ever forget how the political leader of this state ignored the will of his constituents and his Congress. That's all for this week's Virginia Cannabis Report. I'm Joe Parsons with the Virginia Cannabis Connection, reporting for Weed Talk News. Until next time, stay lifted. The Pew Research Group is reporting this week that a whopping 88% of Americans over 21 want to see cannabis legalized for either medicinal or recreational sale. 
The amazing thing about the result of this poll is that favorable responses cut across political party lines and age groups. Now, if you want to break down those results, 57% want cannabis legalized for both medicinal and recreational, while 31% believe that it should only be legal for medicinal patients. Now, if you add those two figures up, you get that whopping 88% total. And now they're all calling for legalization one way or another. So do you think Washington, D.C. might notice those numbers and move on to do some kind of reform? Andrew Berenger tells us that a group of Republican senators sent a letter to the DEA asking them not to take the plant off Schedule 1. Andrew? I am Andrew Berenger, and this is the D.C. Area Report for We Talk News. 2024 is a presidential election year, and the cannabis industry is at the center of it all. A new Pew Research Center survey shows that a majority of Americans support legalizing cannabis in one shape or another. In total, around 88% of Americans say cannabis should be legal for either medical or adult use. If we break it down even further, 57% believe that cannabis should be fully legal for both medical and adult use, while another 32% say it should be legal but only for medical purposes. That leaves just 11% wanting to keep cannabis completely illegal. When it comes to cannabis and politics, there's a partisan divide that may continue to have impacts for legalizing cannabis. Most Democrats, around 64%, say legalizing adult-use cannabis would be good for local economies, while only 41% of Republicans agree with this statement. 58% of Democrats also believe adult use legalization would make the criminal justice system more fair compared to just 27% of Republicans. Republicans tend to see more negatives. Around 48% say legalizing adult use cannabis would make communities less safe and 42% think it would increase the use of adult or heavy use drugs like heroin. A majority of 71% of adults under 30 say adult use cannabis boosts local economies, and 59% it improves the justice system. So while most Americans support some form of legal cannabis, there are clear partisan and generational splits over the potential societal impacts of full legalization for adult use in the United States. Tune in next week for more answers to these questions and more. I'm Andrew Barringer, and this is the DC Area Report for We Talk News. Colorado was one of the first two states to legalize adult use of cannabis 10 years ago. Recently, sales have slumped in the Centennial State. Since 2014, Colorado limited growers to using genetics and seeds from that state only. Now, however, they will be able to go to any licensed provider for seeds and clones. Plus, for the first time, the medical and recreational markets can exchange seeds. Until now, the medical market had also been limited to in-state genetics. Colorado is hoping that now with the variety of strains expanding, the market can recover and grow. Someone who knows all about cultivars and genetics is our California correspondent, Lavana Vassal. Here's her California Cannabis Report. I'm Lavana Vassal with the Bay Sesh reporting for PCM with this week's California report for We Talk News. 420 is coming up. So the rest of the month in the industry focuses on marketing and events around the stoner holiday. Less than a month till 420 and the promoters of San Francisco's Hippie Hill Festival in Golden Gate Park announced that they are canceling the event this year due to lack of sponsorship in the struggling industry. Also, Burner, the founder of Cookies from San Francisco, who hosted the event since 2017, announced he will be in New York City for 420 this year. 420 was originally started by the Waldo Brothers, a couple of San Rafael High School students who met after class to go search for a gorilla grow on Mount Tamalpais in Marin County, the North Bay of San Francisco. This tradition turned into an annual smoke sesh in Golden Gate Park and is now celebrated around the world. Last year, Hippie Hill drew 20,000 people to the park and was highlighted by Mike Tyson punching someone on the plane on the way home, if you remember. The event may have gotten too hyphy for just the park, but have no fear, SF Weed Week is here. 2024 will mark the first official SF Weed Week, and it will consist of seven days of events leading up to 420, which falls on a Saturday this year. And trust me, SF doesn't need the official Hippie Hill event to have an epic 420. 
It comes very naturally to the city by the bay. And there are sure to be tons of events going on all weekend around Weed Week all and all around California. As for San Francisco and SF Weed Week, it's sure to be a blast with tons of events going on all around the city, including some legal lounges, which San Francisco is one of the few cities in California that now allows them. According to their website, sfweedweek.com, they will have seven growers, seven strains, seven lounges, and seven nights. I'm Lavana Vassal from the Bay Sesh, reporting for PCM with this week's California Report for Week Talk News. Testing accuracy continues to cause issues in the industry from coast to coast. Embellishing THC percentage and the use of Delta-8 sets up false results being reported and distributed at dispensaries. That brings us to Amazon. The huge online marketplace has been selling CBD products and hemp-derived THC products. Both are against their own guidelines, but a sample from those products bought on Amazon and tested showed that a whopping 89% of hemp products do not have accurate reporting of the cannabinoid percentages. Some had none at all. Some had one gummy product with a whopping 76 milligrams of THC derived from Delta-8 in it. Once again, the legal market is losing its credibility in some states, but not in Missouri, where Brandon Jones is proud to be part of a new vibrant growing market. Brandon? Hey everybody, it's Brandon Jones with Bee Green Distribution with the Missouri Cannabis Report for Weed Talk News. And yes, we did have a little bit of a deal with the micro licenses that we've been discussing. We actually had nine of them that were revoked. So nine of the social equity or micro license uh, licenses have been revoked within the last two weeks. So they are giving an appeal period. I know a couple of them uh, were from out of state that they found were uh, main, one of the main reasons that they were taking back or revoking these licenses. Another was because there was a felony from an out-of-state thing that happened. So I don't know why that would be something that uh, excludes someone, but they're trying to figure out you know, those and they're turning back to the appeals because this is the month where you can turn in the second round. So we're trying to make sure that the first round of micro licenses are taken care of. And again, that's a second ecosphere of the cannabis ecosystem here in Missouri where we have our license facilities and we're going to have another a micro license uh, that is given to social equity brands here in Missouri too. So you'll have two different sets of dispensaries you can go purchase your uh, products from, and they will be uh, manufactured in completely different ecospheres as well too. Another thing, as we've seen how much sales are jumping out here, we've noticed that now advertising is branching out of Missouri. We saw that some were just a little bit of ways, but now we've seen up to 90 miles away in Iowa, there is a billboard saying, hey, 90 miles that way, and you can get cannabis legally if you're an adult. So we're seeking people, like I talked about, coming in from all the different states around us to come in and get cannabis grown here in the state of Missouri because it is quality. We have some great producers here, and we're seeing some great sales. So, yes, we are at the Show Me State here in Missouri. So that's the Missouri Report. For Weed Talk News, again, I'm Brandon Jones with Be Green, Green Distribution. Stay educate, educated and medicated. Have a great week, everybody. No starting over in Washington State, one of the oldest legal markets, and that's where Matthew Friedlander files his Washington State report this week. Hi, I'm Matthew Friedlander, coming to you from the owner's office here at Skagit Organics with the Washington State Cannabis Report for We Talk News. So we are officially done with legislation this year. The governor has signed every new bill that was passed this session. So all new cannabis laws will take effect either July 1st later this year or whatever date was set in the legislation itself. We have officially moved on to event season. Uh, Northwest Leaf just wrapped up their Leaf Bowl last weekend. That was a great event. Always good to see the cannabis community come together to celebrate each other and all of the great cannabis products and companies that are happening here in Washington. Uh, 420 is coming up, obviously. Uh, the day after that, 421. The Washington Sun and Craft Growers will be hosting their eighth annual Craft Cup. This is an awards event that's more focused on flower, specifically sun-grown outdoor flower. Uh, May 4th in Seattle, the Cannabis Freedom March will be taking place. This is actually a nationwide event. Uh, the Cannabis Freedom March has been happening for many years. It takes place on the same day in many cities across the country. Great event. Highly suggest you look into it if you have never heard of it or never attended. Uh, and the Cannabis Alliance will be hosting their first cannabis summer camp in Leavenworth, Washington, 
July 20th, 21st, and 22nd. Uh, this is just three days of fun in the sun, hanging out in the mountains. There will be a golf event. Uh, there's whitewater rafting. Leavenworth has a new alpine roller coaster, so that should be fun to check out. Uh, this is just trying to get the cannabis community together uh, just to have fun. Uh, that's what the cannabis industry is supposed to be all about, right? <laughs> So that's what I've got for you this week. My name is Matthew. I am reporting for We Talk News. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. While Minnesota continues to figure out how to roll out their now legal adult use market and regulations, their former governor, Jesse Ventura, well, he's entering the edibles game. His wife suffers from a seizure disorder, and she started using THC-infused gummies. And what do you think happened? They worked, and her seizures went away. So now Ventura is teaming up with a retro bakery, a suburban Minneapolis edibles manufacturer, who will be marketing the Jesse Ventura Farms brand of THC edibles derived from hemp. It is still going to be months before their state launches its own set of regulated products for sale to adults over the age of 21. But at last check, Amy Carter from Michigan is over 21, and she's back this week with the Michigan Cannabis Report. I'm Amy Carter from Michigan Weedsters with this week's Weed Talk News. The well-known Michigan brand Better Made is suing over 30 Michigan companies for copyright violations over the use of its trademark on packages of cannabis, flour, and edibles. The company is seeking financial relief in a ban on its trademark usage. Better Made reports it did not authorize the defendant companies to use its trademark in their sales. The lawsuit seeks monetary damages in an order banning the defendants from using better made trademarks in their websites, advertising, packaging, and manufacturing materials. The Michigan Cannabis Regulatory Agency announced that a Lansing cannabis business would surrender their processor license because it had been mixing legal and illicit products for their retail market. TAS Asset Holdings, which is also used the name Noble Road, Noble Road Company, has been closed since February 2023. Its licenses should not be renewed, reinstated, reissued, or reactivated, limited, or otherwise at any future date, the CRA said. The affected marijuana products were marketed under the brand Fuego Extracts with the product name Space Rocks. Who else is ready for Hash Bash? Hash Bash is an annual cannabis-centered event held in Ann Arbor, Michigan, dating back to 1972. A collection of live music and speeches centered on the goal of reforming federal, state, and local marijuana laws. Kickoff is at high noon, and then make sure to visit the Monroe Street Fair just around the corner. I'm Amy Carter with Michigan Weedsters with this week's We Talk News. See you at Hash Bash! Over the past few months, Senators and House reps have used their influence to try to sway the DEA to reschedule, if not totally deschedule, cannabis on the Controlled Substances Act. The executive branch of the U.S., led by President Joe Biden, is also trying to get the DEA to move towards a more fair approach to proper scheduling. However, the DEA is notoriously slow in making any changes to anything it is tasked with. So now a group of prohibitionist U.S. senators, led by Utah Senator Mitt Romney, wrote a letter on behalf of the Foreign Affairs Committee he chairs, urging the DEA not to move cannabis off Schedule 1, citing the same tired rejections and using the same misinformation that has been heard for decades. In that letter, Senator Romney stated, any effort to reschedule marijuana must be based on proven facts and scientific evidence not the favored policy of a particular administration, and account for our treaty obligations. Needless to say, this drew the ire of PCM founder Jimmy Young, who felt obligated to share his own thoughts about the senator's comments. I'm Jimmy Young, the founder of Pro Cannabis Media, and I don't know about you, but when I saw that quote by former governor of Massachusetts, Mitt Romney, the current Utah senator, I got really, really upset because once again, Senator Romney, you are not paying attention to the public and to the over 32,000 scientific and medical research studies on cannabis as a medicine. That's only over the past 10 years. This week, the Pew Research Group released another poll concluding 88% of adults over 21 want the plant legalized. 
Senator Romney, you obviously did not do your due diligence before you wrote that letter to the DEA. You also show your ignorance when you start talking about the kids. Do you have any idea how many kids with epilepsy, autism, Crohn's disease, or a seizure disorder use this medicine right now? Because it works, and their prescribed Western pills don't. I know it's not for everybody, and like the big pharma TV ads remind us all, don't take a Zepic, Dupixin, or Keytruda if you're allergic to it. Well, don't take cannabis if you're allergic to THC, the intoxicating cannabinoid in the plant. Did you know that in the state of Colorado, a state where cannabis has been legal longer than any other, teen use has declined? Seems to me the kids are learning about the dangers of alcohol and the impact of cannabis on their brain somewhere from someone. The federal government, Big Pharma, and the substance abuse community has been trying to find a reason to keep cannabis as a no medical use drug in Schedule 1 of the CSA for decades. Well, guess what? I think it's time to rewrite the CSA and add in alcohol. This time, Senator Bromley, you bring up the UN Treaty on Narcotics as another reason why cannabis should stay on Schedule 1. That treaty was written in 1961. The Controlled Substances Act was written in 1970. It's time to understand and accept that there is a role for Eastern medicine versus Western medicine that dictates our healthcare system. It is the 21st century after all. It's certainly time to break free from the past. From the past. The American pastime of baseball celebrated its first regular season play this week. Opening day in baseball is always considered the unofficial start to spring. Germany is celebrating another type of opening day on April 1st. That's when the sale and adult use of cannabis is officially open in that European country. This is great news for many Canadian and American-based manufacturers who are already operating in Germany. So what impact did it have on the cannabis stocks in the public trading world? Let's ask our man who is high on Wall Street, Doug Miller, for some analysis. I'm Doug Miller from High on Wall Street with this week's Cannabis Stock Report for Weed Talk News. Cannabis stocks have been soaring on the news that Germany's parliament legalized cannabis for personal possession and use. I recently did videos on Canopy Growth Corp, Aurora Cannabis, Cure Relief, and Tilray. I've been saying they were all looking good and setting up the run. I'm always amazed how the chart set up two to three months before any event happens. And this is with every sector in any event. Canopy growth is up over 111% profit since I showed the stock chart setting up. Aurora Cannabis did a reverse split since my video, but it's way up. Cure Relief and Tilray are both up over 30% since I mentioned they were setting up. And I mentioned SNDL on my stock page, and that's up over 38%. If you want to stay up to the minute on stocks and crypto, you can follow my social media pages at DougieFreshPicks.com. Let's take a look at Germany's law, which will take effect April 1st. Adults ages 18 and older may possess up to 25 grams of cannabis for personal use and store up to 50 grams at home. The law also permits cultivation of up to three cannabis plants for personal use and limited public consumption. Beginning July 1st, specialized cannabis clubs will be allowed to grow and dispense cannabis on a limited basis. We may continue to see the cannabis stocks moving up, especially if our country decides to legalize it. And that's this week's Cannabis Stock Report. Reporting for Weed Talk News, I'm Doug Miller. I'm Karen Black from Greenfinger Consulting with the Arizona Cannabis Report for Weed Talk News. Arizonans are bringing the fire. The state set another record with nearly $1.5 billion in cannabis sales in 2023, an increase of almost 5% over the year before, and the third consecutive year, sales have reached $1.4 billion. Adult use accounted for 76% of total sales, up from 70, which highlights the continuing downward trend of the medical market. On the legislative front, two bills have risen out of the ashes. One involves interstate cannabis commerce and notably would expand delivery from 25 to 300 miles. The other revived issues around medical use and the Department of Child Safety. 
There is also movement on a third measure, which is attempting to right past wrongs in the Arizona Social Equity Licensing Program by issuing 17 new licenses. However, the text omitted language prohibiting predatory agreements, which was a big issue with the initial license awards. Speaking of social equity, the Minority Cannabis Business Association's Equity Workshop Tour made a stop in Scottsdale. It was just before the Marijuana Industry Trade Association networking event this past Wednesday. NBCA board chair and tour leader Mike Lamuto was flanked by Chase Chambers of the Arizona Black Cannabis Trade Association and Aden Saldivar representing the ind indigenous cannabis community. They facilitated a group discussion around addressing challenges in the state social equity program. A key takeaway was that in order to enact change, advocates need to organize, present facts, not just passion, and speak with a single unified voice. Last but not least, the inaugural Arizona Growers Cup was held Saturday in Tempe. A distinguished panel of judges blind tested products from across the state in 12 categories. A full list of winners can be found at ArizonaGrowersCup.com. That's all for the Arizona Cannabis Report. I'm Karen Black from Greenfinger Consulting reporting for Weed Talk News. We're working on helping startups and companies that need relatively small amounts of money, meaning $500,000 or less. And what we're doing is, is we're, we've got a funding source that's not basing it on your business plan, on your acumen, on, it's not a venture, it's debt, but it's based on a credit score and two years of tax returns with income. And with that, we can get your money. Not to be outdone are our neighbors to the north in Canada. That's where Debbie Facey files her weekly review of the news from that neck of the woods. This is Debbie Facey with We Talk News coming at you with the Canadian Strain of the Week. So what we have in Canada this week is Burbs Cannabis. After all of their delays and the money spent, they have finally been able to open up their shop out in BC. And then it's also with the backing of the UBC University, which is not only great for them, but it's great for all of Vancouver. Next, what we have is the review of the Cannabis Canada's excess tax. The industry is once again asking for changes, especially when it comes to the affordability of their shops and products and having to deal with competitive pricing. That is something that I hope to be able to obviously keep you up to date with and especially when it comes to any of the changing in the THC potency and the THC restrictions. And last but not least in Toronto, we have the Health Canada asking for a review when it comes to the legalization of cannabis period. Um, we have some actually asking for it to be decriminalized, which I'm sorry to say I did not predict, I can't say I did not predict, due to the fact of the amount of drugs that we are trying to legalize all at once without the complete knowledge, and understanding, and information on how it will affect not only us as adults, seniors, as well as our youth. This is Debbie Facey with the Canadian Strain of the Week. Have a good one. Peace. Back here in the U.S. and in Massachusetts, there is a new secret shopper tool being used by the Cannabis Control Commission to check on licensed operators. They're going to be checking on packaging, labeling, and the credibility of testing results. Unannounced inspections and visits under the cloak of anonymity is a tactic to make sure all dispensaries are in compliance. Another Massachusetts publicly traded company, Agrify, who provides cultivation and extraction solutions to the industry, announced that they have entered into an agreement with New England Edibles doing a business as Soundview. A licensed operator in Bristol, Connecticut, Agrify, will be providing hydrocarbon extraction systems, a vacuum oven package, a short 
a distillation system, and a fume hood. One more Massachusetts note, Canna Provisions, one of the largest dispensary operations in western Massachusetts, is moving from a privately owned operation to an employee-owned business model. In a news release, Canna Provisions explains that they want to make sure and ensure that their employees are not just a participant in the company's journey, but are key drivers in its future. One of the biggest problems in the legal cannabis industry is the credibility of the lab testing of products. Many consumers mistakenly make their product buying decisions based on THC percentage in the flower. So that practice has led to falsifying percentages and backroom deals to ensure products will be sellable. Needless to say, this is concerning, especially to medical patients who look for a consistent cannabinoid profile and terpene descriptions to get the most accurate results from the products they depend on to help offset their medical diagnoses. Now it's happening in Oklahoma, where an independent laboratory analysis of 15 different strains, bought at three different dispensaries, found that THC percentages were inflated. Averages of the discrepancies in flower THC is about 24%, based on a report by National Public Radio. One of the most active and visible new markets for cannabis is in Nevada, and specifically in Las Vegas, which has enjoyed a flourishing industry featuring dozens of dispensaries and now even social clubs. Our new Nevada correspondent is Tina Tasaka, and here is her report for this week. I'm Tina Tasaka with 420 Technologies with the Nevada Cannabis Report for Weed Talk News. Upon residency at the Virgin Casino in Las Vegas, the Wu-Tang Clan are off to other adventures. One of the founding members of the group has collaborated with Hash Story and Grower Circle and has launched a new brand of cannabis called Compliments of the Chef. Check weed maps and local Nevada dispensaries for availability. Planet 13, just off of the Las Vegas Strip, will have the grand opening of their consumption lounge dazed on April 5th. Located inside the 112,000 square foot entertainment complex, the lounge will serve up a tasting menu with superior flour, concentrates, vapes, and crafted canna cocktails. This follows the opening of the recent Smoke and Mirrors Consumption Lounge, and one other is open downtown, Nuwu, a tribally owned entity with the Sky High Lounge and Dispensary. The Nevada Chamber of Cannabis held its chamber meeting in Reno this week. It was a night to connect the cannabis chamber members to meet key figures in Nevada that are up for election in the areas of Senate and state assembly races. And speaking of the Nevada Chamber of Cannabis, the chamber also partnered this week with the MCBA Equity 26 City Tour that rolled into Las Vegas, sharing a four hour workshop benefiting anyone in the cannabis industry. The MCBA, Minority Cannabis Business Association, has built a coalition with so many cannabis associations, such as Normal from 1970, MEDA, the Marijuana Industry Trade Association, the Chamber of Cannabis, and many more. The focus is to discuss social equity, diversity, and inclusion. So look for a tour coming to your city soon. I'm Tina Tasaka with 420 Technologies, reporting for Weed Talk News. Labor unions continue to infiltrate the cannabis industry, and now the delivery driver workers from Ease in Sacramento, California, have joined the Teamsters to protect their rights as employees. This is the third group in California to unionize with the Teamsters, and I wonder what our attorney friend in Illinois, Thomas Howard of Cannabis Legalization News, thinks of the future of unions in the cannabis space. Here's an excerpt from Sunday's show on cannabis legalization. We got some pot stocks. Ah, uh, let's talk about the unions instead of the stocks. Oh, you got because use the it. unions and the stocks are kind of the same sometimes. Oh, uh, but it's it's labor versus capital, and we're going to be reporting on labor a little bit. Uh, so you know who voted to unionize? These cannabis workers. They have joined the local 150 of what I believe is the International Brotherhood of Teamsters. So the delivery drivers at Ease, a multi-state cannabis delivery operator, 
unanimously voted to join Local 150. Is that California or uh, um, Chicago? That is California, was. Sacramento. And so Navis okay. and Amuse workers in Cali have already joined the Teamsters. What do you think about unions and their effect on the cannabis industry? Well, I'm pro-union uh, most of the time, even though I've avoided a couple because I didn't like the way they were business. Because sometimes a union is just a business. And a union depends on like the solid, the, the unity of the people, right? Like I've Purportedly, heard... Purportedly, they are. They, yeah. They're supposed to. But a union can be corrupted by uh, mm -hmm. bad management just as much as a company could be corrupted by bad management. Exactly. Yeah. I, I uh, um, uh, But I heard, like, what is it? The Callus. They're really anti-UFCW right now. And uh, apparently... Uh, he they, he feels a victim of by them so hmm. i don't know yeah interesting well you know they say they finally feel like they have a seat at the table and so that is something that management uh, needs to understand when they're cutting up the pie that is equity it has to be yeah. where your employees say comes in and seriously we might want it's like to get operational i want to do it on a shoestring budget mm -hmm. because if you don't have money coming in you shouldn't have money going out that's just well, running business 101, you know? Exactly. Uh, and so you have to understand what your app OPEX is going to be, and then you have to understand what your uh, sales volume is going to be and your rapidity of that and how well you can grow it. So it's going to be a fascinating thing. If yeah. we That'll do it for this week's Weed Talk News. I'm Jimmy Young in Massachusetts. I'm Karen Black in Arizona. Remember, it's a whole new world of weed out there. Use it responsibly. Elena Pinto will be back next week. <laughs> Some of the largest companies, as you mentioned, you know, Tilton Weed Maps, uh, Harborside, uh, Green Solutions, Medicine Man, many of them have had successful exits. We've made good money in the industry. We want to now give back. We want to now help the small guy or gal that has an idea but doesn't have the friends and family, doesn't have the connections, doesn't have their own equity to contribute. We want to help those guys get into the industry, be able to you know, realize their dreams, be able to do something in addition to what it is they're currently doing now. This doesn't interfere with that. It's not an exclusive. And what we want to do is we want to help birth some new entrepreneurs because you need capital to be able to do that.